Hello and welcome again. In this video, we'll talk about a general idea of the digital signature. Uh, last video, we talked, uh, we had a kind of introduction to what digital signatures are, why they are important, and some example that actually motivated the kind of like the why we have to use digital signatures. So we're gonna give here in this video a general idea. So we're not gonna talk about actually any specific algorithms or any ways on which we're gonna sign messages. We're just gonna talk about in general, uh, how, what is the approach to that? So in general, this is based on public key cryptography. So basically what that means is we're gonna have a couple of things. We're gonna have a public key, which of course, as the name says, is gonna be public. And we're gonna denote it by this case of pop, just a notation, just to remember that it's a key and that it's public. This key is gonna be used to check the validity of the signature. So whether the signature is valid or not is gonna depend on, on this public key. And the private key, which is gonna be denoted by KPR, just to remember that it's a key and this is private, is this is the one that is gonna be used to sign the messages. So this is the idea of that, this public key cryptography. So always in public key, we always have a public key and a private key. And these are the uses in this case for the digital signature. So if you remember the example from the last video, so in our example, Bob is the one who needs to sign the encrypted form because he's sending the form uh, purchases. So he needs to sign it. So just to prove that he actually was the one who actually sent the form. So in this case, Bob needs to generate the public and private key because whoever wants to sign messages, once that person has to generate something that is public, which anyone can check. And this is what they're gonna use to check that actually Bob's signature is valid, which is invented but for Bob also in some situations. And the private key, which is gonna be private for Bob. So Bob is gonna keep this information private, which we're gonna discuss uh, in detail later. But for now, just think about them as just public key, private key. There will be some numbers later. All right, so this is the situation here. So the situation is that Bob uh, and uh, Bob that is here, uh, he has a couple of things he has to generate. The same way he does it with the Elgamal scheme is he gonna generate something that is public and something that is private. What is public is gonna publish that. So everyone has access to this public key and everyone can check whether or not Bob's signatures are correct. Bob is gonna keep the private key, of course, private. And, and the reason for that is because the power of signing the documents is gonna come from this private key. So Bob, if he has the possession of the private key, he will be the only one who can sign that those documents with that a specific private key. So it's a pair of, of things. So these two things, the public and the private, they have to be together. All right, so Bob encrypts the form and signs it. So basically what is gonna happen is, is this. So the basic algorithm of signing is gonna go like this. So we have a message here which is the message that he wants to send. Now, uh, originally he's gonna send, he's gonna put this in the uh, in some kind of algorithm that we're gonna call the signature algorithm, which we're not we're not gonna go into the specifics here. What that is is so just imagine that it's just a black box that has two inputs. One of the inputs is the message, and the other input is the private key. So with the message and the private key. This summon algorithm is gonna do something to these two inputs, the message and the private key, and it's gonna output a signature. And this signature is gonna be some number. So some number that's gonna come out of here. And it's important, and you can see here, not only is the private key an input of the signature algorithm, also the message is an input. So in that way, what's gonna happen is that this signature is gonna be kind of attached to the message. So what you can uh, deduct from here is that every message will have a different signature. So it's not like in the real life signature you always sign all the documents with the same signature. In this case, the signature is gonna change depending on what the message is. So that adds a little bit more of security. So the signatures are gonna change. All right, so that's what the signature part of the message is, which is Bob is trying to assign that and then send it to Alice. Remember from the previous video, he uh, he sends the form and Alice can actually verify that that comes coming from Bob. 
and this is important here so let me emphasize this above is the only one who can generate a valid signature for the message because he's the only one who has the private key so this is supposed uh, to be like that so he has the private key now you might think well what happens if Bob loses that key somebody else can sign it for him and that's actually true of course anything Anything like this, not hundred percent sure. But the thing is, if you have this kind of protocol, then uh, if you lose your private key, is your responsibility. So you can be um, held responsible for uh, keeping your private key private. So that's important. So Bob will be the only one, in theory, who has and can sign his uh, messages because he is the only one in possession of private key. And that would be an ideal situation, which not always happens, but in this case, let's imagine that it happens. So the digital signature is, as I mentioned here, is not of, is of no use if it is not sent with the message. So the, the signature is really attached to the message. It cannot exist without the message. Again, I'm going to say that again. It's not like the signatures in real life, which they can exist by themselves. But the signatures yet can only exist if they are paired with a message. So the signature, as I mentioned, is usually a number. It's usually a large number. For instance, it could be a 2048-bit length number. So that's basically the idea of how these things are signed. Important thing here is there's going to be some kind of signature algorithm, which we will discuss later. It has two inputs, the private key and the message. So Bob is going to send both the message and the signature. Now, when he sends the message, in reality, he's not going to send actually the actual message. He's going to uh, first encrypt it and then send it together with the key. I mean, together with the signature here. So, so that's the encrypted message that is being sent together with the signature. So he goes to the insecure channel. Now, S is not really being encrypted here, but that's okay because the only thing that an attacker can do is verify that this signature is the uh, Bob signature if they have this uh, original message, which they don't have because it's encrypted. All right. So Alice, Alice can now verify that the signature is valid or not. Um, the reason for that is because, remember, they already agree on some um, a method for encryption, which is a symmetric uh, way to do it. They already have a shared key. Now, uh, the way Alice can check that this is a valid signature. She can go and grab the public key of Bob. So she has no access to the private key. So the only one who can generate this kind of message here will be just uh, Bob with that signature. So Alice can't do that. So Bob cannot say, I didn't send the message because he actually signed it. So that prevents that situation from, from the previous example. So Alice now can verify the signature if it is valid or not. To do this, there is some other algorithm called the verification algorithm, which is uh, different from the uh, signature algorithm, which is going to be an algorithm that's going to uh, do the verification. Now, we're going to go into the details later about what this verification algorithm is. But for now, let's imagine that it's just a black box who does the verification. So the situation I have in this picture. So Alice, in this case, receives the message together with the signature. So the inputs of the verification algorithm are going to be two things. Are going to be the message together with the signature and the public key, which is valid for, which is as, uh, uh, accessible to anyone there. So, so now that you put this in here, the verification algorithm, the only thing that's going to do is verify that actual this signature that is here corresponds to this message and it was generated by Bob. So the only output that's going to come from out of here is just true or false. True, if this message came from Bob, signed by Bob, and false if, if it is not that situation. So the inputs of the verification algorithm, as I said, are long integers. So uh, long integers because the message is usually uh, an, in an encrypted number, so just a number, and S is also a number. Uh, however, the output is only true or false. And that's all the thing you need. You just need to check whether or not the signature corresponds to that message and it comes from Bob. So I'll give you two things. Um, as I said before, so it's true if the message was signed with 
the private key that belongs to the public key that is here. So this public private key, they come in pairs. So she will know, I mean, uh, Alice doesn't know what the private key is, that the purpose of being private is only for Bob. But she knows the public key. So that signature will belong to, uh, to Bob if then this uh, algorithm gives, gives true. And it's false otherwise. So that's one way to verify that Bob actually sent that message. Okay, so only the signer, which is Bob, has the ability to generate valid signatures. Remember in the last video, when you don't have that a process of signing the message, they both, both Bob and Alice have the same power. They have the same power of encryption. In this case, Bob is the only one who has the power to do the signature because it's the, this is the only one in possession of the private key. Then we can prove that Bob it, did actually send the message. So this is a good way to prove that Bob actually sent that message. It's also in the interest of Bob because if he wants to sign, for example, a virtual check, then he wants to make sure that that the person who received it can actually check that it is, was actually him. So this kind of proof is actually also uh, important because this type of proof can even have legal meanings. And if they do have legal meanings, like they have legal meanings for handwritten signatures. And this was made into a law in the United States by the Electronic Signature in Global and National Commerce Act, which was a law that was passed in June 30 of 2000. It's a federal law. And this is the copy of the first page of that law that was passed by Congress there, as you can see here. Congress, and then I'm going to point out here uh, something that is important. Um, it says a con I don't know if you can read this correctly, but a content related to such transactions, and they are talking about electronic transactions, might not be denied legal effect, valid or enforceably, solely because an electronic signature or electronic record was used in his formation. So what basically that's saying is that. Electronic signatures have legal meaning, as uh, read handwritten signatures have. So these kinds of things actually have a great importance in electronic uh, commerce, for example. So that's basically all I have to say about the introduction to digital signatures. Now, in the next videos, we'll talk about more specific things. In particular, we'll talk about uh, what are the signature algorithms, how are they going to be signed, the specifics of doing that, and how will the, the verification algorithms to actually check what if the signature is valid or not. So I'll stop the video now and I will see you in the next video.